Hello. Welcome to the SET Institute colloquium series. Uh, I'm Atia Chuk. I'm filling in for Adrian Brown. So today our talk is about a place closer to home on our own planet, about a fascinating place on our own planet. And I have a great pleasure to introduce Shaul Herbert, um, who comes to us uh, from Menlo Park. He works at USGS. He got his undergrad and grad degrees from Hebrew University in, uh, in Israel and has been working at uh, USGS ever since. And his interests lie in the interac interactions between hydrothermal systems and uh, volcanoes. And he'll tell us about the dynamics of the Yellowstone hydrothermal system. Thank you. So thank you all. Thanks for coming. And I hope you all enjoy your lunch while I talk. Um, so today I'll present a few select topics from our recent review paper that I uh, co-authored with my USGS colleague, uh, Jake Lowenstern. And it was published in Reviews in Geophysics just a few months ago. So in 1989, uh, USGS scientist Bob Fournier published a, a review assessing the state of knowledge of the Yellowstone hydrothermal system that was known at the time. And we thought that 25 years later, it's about time to assess what we learned since. So that's the incentive of writing this review. And while writing this review, we uh, um, found out that or notice that really the most, most of the breakthroughs that happened since in the last 25 years uh, are a consequence of application of modern technologies. For example, space technology has brought us GPS, uh, satellite radar, INSAR, those of you who are familiar with the term, um, thermal imaging, and so on. Uh, chemical analytical methods has uh, allowed us to look in great detail at different magmas at crystals and so on and provide inference on what is happening in the subsurface. Uh, sequencing techniques has totally uh, advanced the science of microbiology and genetics and so on. And all these lie on enhanced computing uh, power that also enabled other technologies to emerge. So why, the question of course is why study the Yellowstone? And if you see all these uh, online publications, especially you're probably interested in this one with a <laughs> terrorist. You know, these are all available. You can all find this. This is not anything I made in, in uh, Photoshop. That's not me. But this is uh, people, the, the, the web is full of these kind of, this, this is not unique. The web is full of this. So these are obviously all very exaggerated and this is not the case, but Yellowstone is uh, Earth's most restless volcano caldera. And we do need to assess the hazards. When I say we, it's the USGS. We have the responsibility of assessing the hazards that are posed by this uh, volcanic system. The diversity of, of all the phenomena that is recorded in Yellowstone is really unparalleled. There's nowhere in the world that you can come into one park or one area and find so much diversity. Um, and by studying this diversity, we want to disseminate this information to this year, there were already more than three and a half million people visiting the park. And uh, we mainly want to disseminate this information to the scientific community for a wide variety of uh, subjects. And the last incentive maybe of studying Yellowstone versus other hydrothermal systems is that the park is protected from any exploration. So there's no, because it's a national park, there's no geothermal energy exploration. There's no mineral deposit exploration. So this provides us really with the opportunity to study an undisturbed hydrothermal system. And by doing that, we can provide the park with the information that is required to preserve this uh, unique region for many decades to come. So where is Yellowstone? It's in the northern Rocky Mountains. It's about 1,000 miles from here. So if you get in your car right now, as it said, Google uh, Maps suggests that it would take you about 15 hours to get there. I-80 all the way up. And um, if you look at it, the map here, you could see that Yellowstone is mainly the state of Wyoming with small slivers in Montana, right here, and a little tiny fraction in also in Idaho. So the topics I'll cover today is, it's only a few select topics because this review covers a m w much wider range. And obviously the uh, amount of research that was done in the hydrothermal system is even wider. Uh, so this is a select, uh, choice of mine, which re mainly reflects interests that or projects that I was involved in or my colleagues were. <laughs> 
So I'll give you a kind of a brief overview of the volcanic history and then we'll go into the hydrothermal system where we'll look at the heat and transport and, and mass transport and flux as well. Um, I'm not a microbiologist so I won't talk too much about the thermophiles but obviously in Yellowstone especially in this kind of audience you have to talk about it a bit. And then I'll talk about geysers and hydrothermal explosions and then I'll end with a kind of a look of where we might go in the next decade or 25 years. That's a bit too much into the future. So let's start with the history. So uh, Yellowstone is considered a supervolcano. Uh, we just mentioned there's even a movie called Supervolcano that is based on, on what happens in Yellowstone. Um, there were three large supervolcano eruptions in the last two million years. These are eruptions that formed large calderas. Um, the first one is the one that occurred just over two million years ago, had enormous amounts of ash, about 2,500 cubic kilometers of ash. You can look at this ball right here, it represents the volume. And the distribution of the ash is represented by this dashed line here. If all this ash would fall just on the state of California, it would be equivalent to about five meters of ash all over California. The next one was about 1.3 million years ago, and you could see that there's three digits here and three digits here. That just represents the amazing advances that we made in, in geochronology, which allows us to get this precision. So the next one, again, has about an order of magnitude less volume. It, it erupted the Mesa Falls Tuff. Obviously, the distribution of this ash is smaller right here in this dashed line. And you can see that the volume represented is also smaller. The last one occurred about 0.64 uh, million years ago, about 1,000 cubic kilometers of Lava Creek Tuff. And that eruption is what formed the current Yellowstone caldera. It's represented here, and the distribution is a bit wider, but less volume. Um, all these eruptions had, uh, the tuff had a rhyolitic composition. When I say rhyolite, I'm not sure everybody is familiar with this. That means it's very high in silica. It's very viscous versus, let's say, a basalt that you see in Hawaii. It's much more viscous, making it much more explosive. So that's why the most explosive volcanoes or eruptions on planet Earth occur with a very viscous rhyolitic uh, composition. Um, okay, so let's look at the Yellowstone caldera that I just mentioned that uh, occurred about 640, ah, sorry, I wanted to mention this. Just for example, the, the size of the, this little ball here represents the size of the mountain 1980 St. Helens eruption, compared this to this, or this one, the 1991, I'm sure looking at the crowd, most of you were born and alive at the time. And so these two represent the relative volumes compared to these Yellowstone eruptions. So these were really large events. So now we're into what happens in the last 640,000 years since that last super volcano eruption that produced the Lava Creek Tuff. You see that an outline here in purple is, right here, is the Yellowstone caldera. And there's a few things to notice. One is that the um, volume of those now viscous rhyolitic flows rather than ash. So these are big oozes of rhyolite that just flow, covered huge areas inside the caldera and also outside. About the same order of magnitude of the volume that has erupted during the eruption itself. About a thousand cubic kilometers of thick viscous rhyolitic flows. The basalts that are much denser than rhyolite, so they're less buoyant and therefore they only emerge on the margins of the caldera, right here in yellow. These yellow colors represent the uh, basalts. And the last volcanic eruption that occurred in Yellowstone is about 70,000 years in the south part of So no volcanic eruption in Yellowstone in the last 70,000 years. Modern analytical techniques, as I mentioned before, have allowed us to infer a lot about what's going on in the subsurface. So this is an example of the, uh, it's called the SHRIMP RG, that stands for a Sensitive High Resolution Ion Microprobe. That's in Stanford, just down the road. And what it allowed us is putting a very small beam of ions right onto the crystal itself, right in the center of the crystal, the sides of the crystal, and we can get a lot of information for th from that. For example, we can use the uh, systematics of uranium, thorium, and lead and their isotopes to get precise dates of these crystals and see when those crystals formed from the magma that was in the subsurface. Um, we can also get from these uh, crystals the major chemistry of them so understand what kind of magma was there when they crystallized. 
We can also, modern analytical techniques also enabled much more precise dating. In the past, we used to use a system called potassium argon, and now we move to a system called argon argon mainly, and that allows the precision of samples or of dating to be much, much better, which in turn gives us a much better understanding of the volcanic history. So what we really learned from uh, these beam techniques, like the one at the shrimp and at Stanford and, and microprobes and, and many other systems, is that from the analysis of individual crystals rather than the whole magma, we can learn a few things. One, that the reservoir in the subsurface of Yellowstone is probably a long-lived and is there since that 640,000 years eruption, maybe a bit after, but it is long-lived. The main thing is that silicic magmatism uh, proceeded via uh, melting in distinct pockets. So you can see here these distinct pockets. It's not the whole thing at once melts and erupts. In the last 640,000 years, most of the eruptions occurred from these very distinct pockets. Each one is characterized by different age, by different, uh, slightly different chemistry, not much, but slightly different chemistry. And they mainly formed from the uh, eruption, the, the products that erupted are um, rocks that probably erupted earlier or were hydrothermally altered. And that the source of the heat is from pulses of basaltic magmatism right here in the bottom that provide all that heat to melt the small pocket and make it erupt. And that this thing didn't happen throughout the 640,000 years that it was in distinct time zones that was uh, very, uh, um, sh that were relatively short where all that uh, magma or lava has erupted. So a few distinct periods throughout those 640,000 years. And what we know now versus what we knew in the past is that this model of a big, huge magma chamber just all erupting at once is probably not the case. We are more in favor of this case here where we have distinct pockets of melt in the subsurface that are slowly crystallizing and erupting you know, at different times and different locations. Another way to look at what's happening in the subsurface is using what's called seismic tomography, is looking at how seismic waves move through the subsurface. And this is a recent study that was done by the University of Utah group. And what they see here is that these seismic waves have very low velocities just underneath Yellowstone. This is the red area right here. And they noted uh, actually a very large magma body just underneath Yellowstone, again here in red. And that this magma body has, is at depths of about 5 to 17 kilometers, depends on the parameters that you put in there, but that's about the range. And that this uh, magma body extends about 15 kilometers to the northeast of the caldera. It's not confined to the caldera, but it's mainly underneath the caldera and confined to the northeast. And they estimated, this study estimated that the uh, volume of this magma body is about two to 600 cubic kilometers. Again, just for reference, we said that there were 1,000 cubic kilometers that erupted in the Lava Creek Tuff, about 1,000, six to, 600 to 1,000 cubic kilometers of lava, lava that erupted since then, and that's their estimate of the lava that has erupted. Assuming that there's about five to 15 percent melt fraction, which is quite an assumption. And this is just a 3D representation of that magma body. However, the, this study does, or any tomographic study as of yet, does not have enough resolution to look in uh, or find these distinct pockets of magma that I just mentioned. So what it really tells us is that this whole area here in red actually represents this whole area here, which is of, when you average it, is of low velocity. You notice that this area here is slightly, has even lower velocities, and that's the area in the east part of the caldera where magma is assumed to be a bit shallower, and there's other indicators that might tell us this might be one of those pockets, but again, this is a bit of a stretch. So Yellowstone is, there's a lot of seismicity in Yellowstone, a lot, a lot, a lot of earthquakes every year, and um, most of them occurs, occur in what we call seismic swarms. That is, these earthquakes are clustered both in space and in time. And most of these earthquakes, uh, most of these swarms occurred uh, through distinct events. And these are just three examples. The first one from 1985 occurred in the northwest part of the caldera. There's this one here that occurred just at New Year's Eve between 2008 and 2009 underneath Yellowstone Lake. And then the last one, of, cur of course, occurred in the winter when nobody's there in the Madison Plateau. So there was no real good visuals of what's happening at the surface. But what's, what we can say is that once we use 
modern methods of relocation of these earthquakes, they all seem to fall in a distinct fault or series of faults, and these earthquakes migrate in time along the dis a distinct. So you can see here from start to end, they have a temporal pattern which is consistent probably with the uh, movement of aqueous rich fluids rather than magma moving along fractures or distinct faults in, in the shallow crust. You can see that the, these are all in the relatively f upper few kilometers of the crust. Yellowstone is also characterized by uh, um, cycles of inflation where the whole Yellowstone caldera goes up and then goes down. And the first measurement that was done was in 1924 and with a benchmark that was measured and then occupying the same benchmark about 50 years later revealed that there was a significant uplift of the caldera. Since then, um, many leveling studies have occurred and after 1990-91 we started with GPS and then with what's called INSERT for those that's ra satellite uh, radar on a satellite. And we can see those distinct cycles of uplift and, and subsidence. And another important character of these episodes is that when we transition from uplift to subsidence, we see one of those big swarms that I just saw. So this number one swarm here is the one that I showed in the north, northwest part of the caldera. This number two is the one underneath Yellowstone Lake, and this is the one underneath the Madison Plateau. And what we think this res represents is actually that perhaps there's a pressure in the hydrothermal system that is building up. And then once these swarms occur, fluids migrating out of the caldera outwards, and it's like a pressure valve. And releasing that pressure, and the thing starts subsiding, and the whole cycle starts again. So let me just kind of provide a de uh, brief summary of what I just mentioned about the magmatism, volcanism, Yellowstone. We said there were three caldera forming eruptions in the last two million years. The last one was 640,000 years ago. The last volcanic eruption, which was a, a flow, occurred 70,000 years ago. There's a huge seismic velocity anomaly underneath the caldera that extends to the east, and that might represent a very large mag magma body. Um, petrologic, petrologic studies that are based on these uh, beam techniques and chemistry imply that magmatism proceeded via remelting in distinct pockets rather than one whole big, huge chamber. And that extensive seismicity in and around the caldera actually uh, represents, is associated with episodes of caldera-wide inflation and deflation. And that's, and that's what I'm saying here, that that transition is associated with seismic swarms. So before I get into the hydrothermal system, we now want to uh, understand how heat and mass are transported between the magma depth and the hydrothermal system above it. So what we do know is that there should be uh, a thermal boundary layer surrounding the magma. If it's a magma pocket, it's a bigger magma body. And that um, thermal boundary condition, uh, layer is called the uh, brittle ductile transition zone because the rocks underneath that transition zone are assumed to be ductile and with flowing with low permeability, whereas above it, they're brittle. Uh, there's permeability, and we assume that the pressure up there is about hydrostatic, maybe slightly above it, whereas below it, it's lithostatic. And that heat and mass are transported mainly due to episodic breaching of this unit, this narrow boundary layer here, and that's when heat and mass are transported from magma into the hydro hydrothermal system. So now let's go into this hydrothermal system, this upper part and see what we see in Yellowstone. So Yellowstone has more than 10,000 thermal features. Studying all of them is almost impossible. Many of them are really remote. Some of them are uh, overpopulated with tourists. So there's the whole range. The Yellowstone has a very harsh winter, so working in the winter there is hard. So studying these 10,000 thermal features is almost impossible. But what we do know is that there's a very, s their character is based, on, uh, is, is a manifestation of both topography and lithology. So at higher elevations, in the, mainly in the eastern part of the park, in some local areas right around here, um, we know that the, water the topography is higher, um, the water table is deeper, and these areas are dominated by vapor dominated zones. That is, the water table is boiling and the vapor comes up with a lot of gases and brings with it, and the waters are their acid and sulfate. So they're very acid pHs of six and below, and they have a lot of sulfur in them. 
Whereas in the lower parts of the park, uh, in the geyser basins, we have uh, what's neutral and alkaline chloride water. So the pHs are higher, um, they have high concentrations of chloride, and the temperature at the surface is boiling temperature, which in Yellowstone is about 92 to 93 degrees C. I'm talking now in Celsius, not Fahrenheit. And in the northern part of the park, whoever was there, there's Mammoth Hot Springs, where the, there's shallow carbonate rocks just near the surface, and the water there are rich in bicarbonate and carbonate, and they deposit travertine. This is right here near the north entrance of the park. So let's just kind of uh, describe a bit. The neutral alkaline chloride, the ones that are in the geyser basins. So you can see here an example of one of the geysers. And this is a, uh, one of the famous features called Grand Prismatic Pool, just as an anecdote. Last year, there was a drone that fell down into this pool, and it's still stuck down there. So whoever wants to go, don't go diving, but it's right down there. Um, they're characterized by uh, near boiling temperatures, 92 to 93 C. Uh, very high chloride, sodium, and silica in these waters. The pHs go all the way up to almost 10. There's almost no CO2 flux from the areas around the, these features, and they deposit sinter, which is a, a form of rock that is rich with silica, uh, which is SiO2, uh, minerals. What we do know is that many of these thermal features in, in these geyser basins and, and the surrounding here in yellow occur at the terminations of these very large rhyolitic flows that I just described before. And they occur mainly where these flows are in contact with uh, cemented glacial deposits. So Yellowstone, of course, was glaciated quite a bit. And those glacial deposits that carved big chunks of these basins and formed these basins form their, uh, you know, their till, which is cemented. It's called came. And the, many of these fit features, those yellow features, occur at the contacts between these rhyolitic flows and the came. There were also, um, this is mainly discoveries that were made in the mid-90s, late 90s and early 2000s um, in Yellowstone Lake. And you can see there's a lot of thermal features here in yellow, again, in the northern part of the lake. You don't see uh, any of them in the south yet. Uh, maybe you will, but for now they're all in the northern part of the lake. And they, their composition is very similar to those that I just showed you in the geyser basin. So they're silica rich, sodium rich, chlorine rich, and their pHs are usually quite high. And they form these beautiful features that some of you who, who learned about black smokers and the mid-ocean ridge might think of something like these. Th these are silica spires right here, right in the bottom of the lake. And they discharge a lot of thermal waters right out of them. And their advantage is that they're at, because they're under water pressure, so the temperatures, the boiling temperatures are higher. So the temperatures of these features are higher than those that we find in the geyser basins. Now let's move to those that I mentioned that are the east part of the park, the acid sulfate waters. Uh, what you see there usually is what we call rotten ground. You see this area with no vegetation, with fumaroles, mud pots. That's just like, that's, it sounds and looks exactly the same. These are just like a lot of clay rich uh, minerals in those boiling pools. And you see here areas of, for example, native sulfur. So, what we do know in this area, there's very little water. Again, I mentioned that these are where vapors from the boiling water table come up to the surface. So there's not a lot of water table, water discharge. The co concentration of chlorine is very low in these features. The pHs go all the way down to almost one. The CO2 flux in these bare grounds is very, very high. And there's a lot of acid sulfate alteration. And you can see also these native sulfur deposits. In Mammoth Hot Springs, which I mentioned is the north part of the park, uh, the waters, the, there's uh, limestones that are very close to the surface and the thermal waters come right up through them and dissolve them and then precipitate at the surface these beautiful travertine deposits. I don't know who visited there, but they're very nice. Probably the biggest in the world as those uh, terraces, travertine terraces of Mammoth Hot Springs. The pHs are quite neutral, but they increase as the CO2 is the gas, as the water comes out the surface and the CO2 is the gas. The waters are rich in calcium, magnesium, bicarbonate, and sulfate. So then the calcium reacts with the carb bicarbonate and forms those uh, deposits, the travertine deposits. So the first topic I'll kind of try to cover is the uh, heat transport and flux in the, from the system. Um, this is a heat flow map of the, of the entire North America. And you can see that the west is very red. The, 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 the poor folks in the east, 
they didn't get global warming, I guess. I don't know. But <laughs> they have it uh, very cold, not only up above surface, but also on the subsurface. Um, so if you can see here in the Rocky Mountains, this is kind of an anomalous region even for the west. And if you look even further in this area right here, this is Yellowstone where the average of the heat flow from Yellowstone is more than 40 times that of the average continental crust, that is all the crust in, around the world, or even 40 times higher than just in the Rocky Mountains themselves. So the question then is how do we actually quantify heat flow from Yellowstone? And that we dedicated quite a lot of time in the last you know, few decades. And it's the basic idea for quantifying the total heat output from the system is based on a uh, method that was developed in New Zealand in the 1950s and 60s called the Chlorid Inventory Method. And then was adapted to the US by my co colleague Bob Fournier that I mentioned before and, hi and his uh, buddies at the time. And what it tells us is that if you plot the, uh, the chloric concentration in all the thermal springs, so each one of these dots represent one of the thermal basins or the groups of thermal springs in the park. And if you plot their chloric concentration versus their temperature, uh, it's actually geothermometer temperature, but we won't go there. And then you put a join from meteoric water, that's water that doesn't have any chloride and has, it's cold, so it has no enthalpy, and you uh, straight line through them, and then you have another line that goes from the enthalpy of steam that has zero chloride because it's steam, and all the way to the uh, sample that has the most concentrated chloride in the park, which is in this case Crater Hills. Where it meets, that's the composition of the parent fluid. We can go into more details, but I won't bore you with the details. And everything f from along this is just water that evaporated, so it lost vapor, but it was more concentrated with chloride. So if we look at the composition of this parent fluid, it has a t an enthalpy that is equivalent to about uh, 340 degrees C's, uh, Celsius and about 400 milligrams chloride per liter. So what we need to then to do is measure the amount of chloride that comes out of the system, and I'll talk about it later, but we know now that on average we have about 50 kilotons of chloride that are discharged out of the Yellowstone system every year, and if we relate this 50,000 to this amount of enthalpy in the water, in that parent fluid, that tells us that there's about 6.4 <coughs> gigawatts of total heat output from the system. And that is output mainly by advection because if we apply simple um, Fourier conduction laws, that would say that the temp uh, thermal gradient would be about 1,000 degrees per kilometer, which is not the case in Yellowstone or anywhere in the world. But as there's huge uncertainties in these estimates because, as again, I, I told you, we use here a, a value. You can see the scatter around these points, and this could move anyway, and this arrow can move quite a bit as also, and that's assuming these assumptions are correct. But if we just look at the input parameters of instead of 400 milligrams per liter of chloride, we put 450, and instead of 340 degrees C, we say it's 320 degrees C, and instead of the 50,000 tons per year that we measure now, of chloride, we say 45,000, we'll have a heat output of about four gigawatts of heat coming out of the system. And if we do the exercise in the other way, you know, just put less chloride and, and higher temperature and more chloride coming out of the system, we'll get to about eight gigawatts. So small, what, small variations result in very, in parameter values, result in la very large variations in the output estimates. And this is about as certain as we probably are in what we think is the heat output of the system and we hope to improve it, but for now this is what we can say. And that's a lot of heat, but still the uncertainty is, is huge. Another way to look at it is say that is more theoretical and say that instead of measuring how much chloride is coming out of the system and what does chloride do on the way, is just assume that we start with that 340 degree fluid that I just said before and bring it this PF, which stands for parent fluid, and you, by adiabatic decompression all the way up to the surface in Yellowstone, which is 92, 93 degrees, what we do is if we bring that parcel of liquid, which is now along that uh, one phase, it's still one phase here, but we bring it up, it becomes a two phase uh, system, and that would bring about, by mass, about 53 weight percent of steam and 47 weight percent of liquid. That steam would, because of the very high heat capacity, would bring with it about 5.6 gigawatts, whereas the liquid would only bring a small amount with it. So a total of about 6.3 gigawatts, which is kind of a 
in the ballpark estimate of this previous estimate that I said before. Um, we did another survey, which I won't uh, present here, but we looked at areas that where the steam actually comes, and there we got actually to the lower side, maybe closer to the four gigawatts. So again, large uncertainties, but this is kind of the range that we get. Another way to look at it is a study that my USGS colleague, uh, Greg Vaughn, who is at the USGS Astrogeology Program in Flagstaff, and he uses uh, both MODIS and ASTER. These are two uh, different radiometers on, on, satel on satellites. And he looks, so MODIS has a, very, a better temporal resolution, but it's very coarse in terms of its pixels. I forgot the dimensions, but it's big. Aster has about a 90 meter pixel, but its temporal uh, orbiting is quite bad. So by using these two and only for nighttime uh, images, that's the main thing. You have to use nighttime images. Previous studies have used daytime and resulted, then the results were non-reliable. But he estimates that based on these two system, these two methods, that he estimated that over the entire park you get about two gigawatts, which is about half the minimum that I said before. But you have to account that this only, or this only accounts for the radiative component rather than all the advective component. So even here, in the, these pixels in, in, in Aster, where you get a 90 meter pixel, you won't uh, detect the very small springs that you can see here when you use, let's say, a FLIR. FLIR is a forward-looking infrared camera on a, that you can mount to an uh, aircraft and go at uh, lower latitudes and map. So if you would use this kind of method at high temporal resolution and high um, spatial resolution, which it provides, it would ultimately give a much higher number than this. So let's just summarize again what we said about the heat transport in the system. It's one of the biggest anomalies on Earth. Uh, based on that chloride inventory method that I mentioned, we say maybe four to eight gigawatts, still large uncertainties. A significant amount of the heat is transported by steam. We said about 53 weight percent of steam, which brings most of the heat with it. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainties within each method and between the different methods. And that satellite-based remote sensing uh, only accounts for the radiative components, and that is the limitation right now. Uh, but despite these uncertainties that we have, this order of magnitude range that we do get of a few gigawatts does give us some estimates to constrain what's happening in the subsurface in the magmatic system. Crystallization rates, cooling rates, and so on. The next topic I'll cover is, the, um, is about the chemistry and the mass transport. And when we talk about mass transport from magmatic system, uh, what we call the volatiles in a magmatic system, the main ones are CO2, sulfur, chlorine, and fluorine. These are the ones that we want to track. So what we need to do is look at how these are coming out of the system. So this is a magmatic system. And we know, based on many studies in other places and in Yellowstone as well, that if we measure the gas in the system, we'll probably detect CO2 and H2S, but not no, in Yellowstone, no chlorine, no fluorine, but some sulfur as well and the H2S. And bicarbonate would be H2O, it would be as CO2. In the liquid phase, we could uh, detect CO2 as bicarbonate. This is HCO3. Chloride, dissolved chloride, dissolved fluoride, and now the sulfur is in the form of sulfate. So this is how we do it. And how do we? We need to quantify the flux, how much is coming out, so we can, like with a heat, we can provide some estimates of what's happening down in the magmatic system. And there's a lot of uh, spatial and temporal variability that we need to characterize. So let's start with looking at water chemistry. Again, I mentioned that there's about 10,000 thermal features in the park. It's impossible to measure each one of them separately and uh, characterize the chemistry and its flux. So rather than that, what we did in the last, say, less than a decade is we, uh, well, for a chlorine, we did it for a long time. For the rest of the chemistry, we did it for about a decade. We um, Instead of going to the features, we go to each river that drains a wide area which has all those thermal features and characterize what's in the river, hoping that that represents well the, the thermal areas. And actually it does. So for example, you can see here in, in green, this is the Firehole River, which drains the upper, lower, and midway geyser basins. That's all the major geyser basins in Yellowstone. 
Uh, here in yellow, in yellow is the Mammoth Hot Springs, which I mentioned before, which drain those springs that are rich in bicarbonate and deposit travertine. The, the uh, red area here is um, the Yellowstone River just outside the park, which drains the largest area of the park and represents quite a few thermal areas as well. So, and here in purple is the Yellowstone, what comes out of Yellowstone Lake right here. So this is kind of a, a ternary diagram that represents here cations, potassium, calcium and magnesium and sodium. And here on the bottom one, we look at the anions, the bicarbonate, the chloride and the sulfate. So the river chemistry is kind of an integrated look at these 10,000 thermal features. So we can represent the spatial variability quite well. We also notice that there's a lot of uh, seasonal variations. So this is, a, for example, the in, uh, in uh, red here is the Firehole River, the one that drains the geyser basins. And in blue, the, the uh, Yellowstone River, the one that's here actually in red dots. And what we see here is that every time in about April, May, and June, when the big uh, runoff comes in, we see a big spike in the, cons in the ratio. So this is not dilution or any other effect. This is just the chemistry changing. For example, there's much more, the ra this ratio increases, all these ratios increase during the snow melt right here in marked in yellow. And what it brings is actually we say that we have, during the base slope flow, we have many thermal waters that are discharged into the, from those springs that are discharged into the, uh, into the rivers. Whereas when we have the snow melt that brings all the shallow parts of the chemical weathering, what weathers the very shallow parts of the, uh, or the soils or the very shallow subsurface. And that brings, that composition is very different. So in order to account for what comes, we have to account for this spatial variability and for this temporal variability. So let's look now, I talked about water chemistry, let's look, about, let's look at gas chemistry. Um, this is my colleague Bill Evans, and you can see here putting a, a, a titanium tube into the subsurface. This is very altered ground, and you put it in and you have gas coming right into, the, into this tube, and he collects it in the evacuated gas flask right here. And then we, another example is here where we have those pools that are bubbling a lot and we just could put a funnel on top of those bubbling areas and collect those gases right into a uh, uh, evacuated flask and bring it into the lab. And what we see is that there's a wide distribution in the composition of gases in Yellowstone. Again, these are just one example of a ternary diagram where we see methane at the top, argon and helium. And you could see that each area in the park is mainly affected by its location, the, the geology or the rocks that it comes through, and that they represent, these samples represent varying contributions from magmatic, that is something that comes from depth, crustal that's coming from shallow, and atmospheric, which means it comes through the meteoric water with it. So again, this is, for example, Washburn Hot Springs in the, in the northeast part of the park, where you see a lot of methane, but we also see a lot of ammonia, and that represents probably a lot of organic material in the gas itself. One thing that uh, volcanologists more and more have used it over the last few decades, or decade and a half or two, is use the isotopes of helium. So that is the ratio of the uh, helium three to four in the gas sample versus that in the uh, air. So when we say uh, a, a value of let's say 10, that means that the ratio in the gas is about 10 times higher than the ratio at, in the air. And these samples in Yellowstone have very high uh, um, helium isotope ratios, RC over RA, or the ratio in the gas over the ratio in the atmosphere. And they're mainly, the highest values are located mainly in the eastern part of the park where I showed you that before there was a large seismic anomaly that is the largest right here in the area called Mud Volcano. And they get to values of about 17 RA, 17 times that of the atmosphere. And what that tells us is that those gases in this area are mainly coming right from the mantle, from the deep earth right up to the surface without a lot of interaction with the crustal rocks. Whereas as you go outwards, especially like places like this, they're very low. And there they either interacted a lot and you put a lot of helium-4, which is an alpha particle, into the sample and the ratio goes down and, and you see this, whereas in contrast to this. 
uh, I said that from those volatiles, one of them is sulfur. That's a major volatile that comes out of a magmatic system. But sulfur is probably the most complex of all. It's very hard to uh, understand its behavior and therefore quantify the flux out of the system. Uh, there's a lot of microbial involvement in the sulfur cycle and also in organic. For example, in this case, the oxidation of, of the H2S that comes up from depth to the surface and is oxidized and form these nice native sulfur deposits, elemental sulfur. And another example is, is when the sulfur is already in the water. I said it's in the dissolved form. It's sulfate SO4 right here. And if you look at it as a function of pH, you see that there's, you know, it's not linear. Um, there's evaporation which concentrates it about a lot. There's formation of minerals like gypsum or anhydrite that form. And there's solubility issues that are dependent on the pH of the water. So quantitative estimates of sulfur from, this, from the Yellowstone system are, are the most difficult from all these volatiles that I mentioned. Another example of the complexity of sulfur, and actually it's a beauty uh, that most of you will probably not get to see because it's in the backcountry. It's called Cinder Pool, and it's in uh, Norris Geyser Basin. And what you see there is, uh, is actually spherules of molten sulfur right here. So sulfur melts at a temperature of about 114 degrees Celsius, not Fahrenheit. And what these form is these hollow sulfur spherules that are they're hollow, so they're uh, buoyant, and they rise up to the surface, and they just float on the lake here. You see these black spherules just floating on the lake. And if you look in this kind of diagram, this is a PhD study that was done at Stony Brook, I don't know, uh, 15 years ago. Um, you can see that the dynamics of sulfur speciation in this water body is really, really complex. There's a lot of different species. Each one of them has an equilibrium at different temperature, a different oxidation rate, and, and different time scales. So the kinetics are, and the thermodynamics of this sulfur cycle are very complex. So now I mentioned that we look at the rivers for the water chemistry. How do we measure the flux of these sulfur, CO2, chlorine, and fluorine out of the perk? So we, starting in the 80s and slowly it evolved throughout the years, we, USGS has uh, gauges along the major rivers that drain Yellowstone. And you can see an example of this gauge on the Yellowstone River just at the lake outlet right here. And in these gauges, we measure, measure water discharge continuously. So every 10 or 15 minutes, there's a pulse of the satellite would send a transmission and it would tell us what the discharge is at the time. And then we have technicians in, these, in, in Montana that go out there and, and um, calibrate these systems. So we have quite good estimates of water discharge. In addition to that, what we did in the last maybe two decades, and again improved in the last decade, is um, have people go and sample these rivers up to about 20 times or 28 times a year at the most. That's 28 is optimal. We never get there, but that's our goal of 28 times a year to sample these rivers. It's, it's quite tough. And there, therefore, if we multiply the concentration of these uh, uh, in the samples versus against the discharge, by the discharge, what we get is the net flux at every given point, and then we can integrate it throughout the year. To measure the CO2 flux, a lot of it, I, as I mentioned, comes out of the gas phase, and a lot of it is diffused, coming just through soils. What we do is, you can see here, this, this is called an accumulation chamber. And we form a grid over these thermal areas where we have a lot of altered ground acid sulfate, I mentioned. And this uh, chamber is connected to an IR analyzer right here in the back, in the backpack here. And we form a grid, a dense grid, about every depends the area, but about every 20 meters we go and measure, and then we integrate the air and we say out of this area we have X amount of CO2 uh, coming out. And then we can come and put all these different areas right here in these boxes and get the statistics on them, the distribution, the outliers, and so on. And we know that in Yellowstone the mapping suggests that there's about 35 square kilometers of the thermally altered acid sulfate area, uh, and that accounts for about 97% of the total diffuse CO2 flux. This is based on a, a PhD study that my USGS colleague Cindy Werner did, again, about 15 years ago. So when she did her PhD, again, her estimate based on limited areas was about 45 kilotons per day of CO2. That's a lot. For, just to give you context, again, if you look at the anthropogenic source of CO2, that's, that's a fraction. That's less than 0.1% of the total anthropogenic. But if you look in volcanoes, that's probably the second biggest emitter in the world after Mount Etna in Italy. So that's, that's quite a bit. 
And, but since she finished her uh, PhD, and now she's also with the USGS, we did many more areas covered and slightly improved our st statistics. And by improving the statistics, we just get to a wider range. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's how confident we are in this. So, so you can play with statistics a lot, and, and this does not even account for temporal variations. But again, this gives us a range of what order of magnitude number, which is very good for us. So now let's kind of summarize all those numbers that I get. So we say we have the what we measure in the rivers, right? And this column, all the CO2, you can see by mass, it's by far the, even as bicarbonate, it's the greatest uh, volatile that's coming out as discharged out of the system, followed by chloride, then sulfur and fluoride. And for the, um, we say that about 30 to 50 percent of that CO2 is derived uh, from pre quaternary sed uh, sedimentary rocks. So, you know, if we look at all this and this together, what comes through soils, before I, I had a larger range, but this kind of accounts for it. Um, Part of it comes from the shallow limestones that are in the subsurface and other rocks, but most of it comes from deep, or 50% maybe comes from a deep magma. Um, we know that if we take all this mass that's coming out now, and we, we can't not dissolve it in the rhyolites. I told you all the rocks that are coming out of Ye Yellowstone are rhyolites. But if you take a reasonable volume, of, or even a large volume of rhyolite, you cannot dissolve all that, half of that CO2 that's coming out here into that rhyolite, which tells us that a lot of that CO2 has to come from a deeper basaltic source, a depth, the solubility of CO2 in basalt is much higher than that in rhyolite. To get at the sulfur numbers, so I, we measure again the river, that's easy, I said, but to me get at what's coming out of the um, gas, the way we do it right now is we take the H2S that's coming out of a fumarole and we ratio that with a ratio of the, we ratio that to the concentration of CO2. So we know the CO2 flux, we know the H2S to CO2 mass ratio, and that's how we get to the uh, H or the sulfur flux out of the system through the gas, and that's combined with this. And what we did then is we compared it with those crystals that I mentioned at the beginning. We go to crystals that erupted in the last few hundred thousand years, and some of these uh, crystals, these are quartz, quartz crystals that have some melt trapped in them right here, melt inclusions we call them. And if we measure the concentrations of, with a beam of chloride and fluoride and, and sulfur and, and uh, CO2, we see that these really, these rhyolites have no, or very low concentrations of CO2. We couldn't detect it was below detection limit the amount of sulfur, but we did f measure quite a lot of chlorine and fluorine here. And if we look now at the chlorine to fluorine ratio in what's coming out of the system, there's nothing in the gas. Yellowstone gases have no HF or no HCl, but there's in the rivers quite a bit. And we know that the chlorine to fluorine mass ratio in the rivers is about eight. But if we look at these melt inclusions, it's about half. So there's a huge difference between what's coming here, what we see here and here. And what that tells us, that there's two options. Either there's a large sink of fluoride, uh, fluorine in the system, which is what we believe, or there's a large source of chlorine somewhere in the shallow crust. And if that would be the case, then all what I mentioned before about the chloride inventory method would be down the drain, because there's another source of chlorine. But we don't think this is the case. Chlorine is relatively a conservative element in the shallow crust and does not react. So based on all these studies of the heat and the mass, we have kind of a general understanding of what we think is happening right now in the magmatic system. Again, the last eruption was 70,000 years ago, so we have to use inference to understand what's going down now. So we think that there's continuous intrusion of basalts down in the system and that this area here we see, rather than this one continuous melt that I show here, actually pockets and these occasional intrusions of basaltic magma from here to here are what's driving what's happening now in the hydrothermal system. And if another aspect of it is we take all that CO2 that's coming out, and I told you that's a lot, and we kind of flush it back into the subsurface, we notice, and we kind of 
try to estimate the thermal gradient beneath Yellowstone here in Yellowstone. So we give it a wide range, but we estimate and we put all that CO2 and try to dissolve it in water. It won't dissolve into groundwater. Part of it has to be a different phase. So this is an immiscible two-phase system in much of the upper crust of Yellowstone, very rich in CO2. So the Yellowstone hydrothermal system is multi-phase and CO2 rich. So let's just summarize this area, this topic of chemistry and mass transport. We say there's large temporal and spatial variations in water and gas chemistry, and these variations are controlled by topography, lithology, and magmatic con contributions, and the temporal variations are also affected by uh, snow melt. There's a very large flux of CO2, from, mainly from the acid sulfate areas, implying vapor saturation in the subsurface. And that also that all that CO2 means derivation from a deep basaltic source. The speciation of, of sulfur I showed is quite complex, and that helium isotopes and the ratio of helium isotope, uh, helium three, which is the magmatic component, let's say, to CO2, they have mantle values that suggesting that there's mantle gases coming up now. And I didn't mention this, uh, this is just a side note, that there's very high concentrations of some metals and metalloids. That actually, those that form ore deposits are very low and usually below detection limits, but others like that form oxyanions and mainly arsenic. Arsenic is about two orders of magnitude in <coughs> most thermal features greater than the EPA standards of drinking water. So if any of you visit, don't drink the waters from the thermal features. Um, this is where I hope I won't slide because I'm not a biologist, but I think this is a fascinating area and I know here people are kind of, might be interested in the topic. Um, so the early work on thermophiles actually in the world started in Yellowstone. Uh, Thomas Brock was at the time a professor at Indiana University and I think then moved to Wisconsin. And he uh, actually, he uh, isolated in the bacteria uh, Thermus aquaticus in the lower geyser basin, actually in Octopus Spring. And that opened a can of worms. I mean, that was, the, the amount of research that was done since then is, is enormous. I mean, unbelievable. And also this has led to the commercial use of the enzyme of this bacteria, and that generated a lot of bucks. And when the Park Service knew that this generated a lot of bucks, of course, they wanted their share of the deal. So now any microbiologist that wants to work in Yellowstone actually has to sign uh, an agreement with a park in order. And there's a lot of implications from these. So I, I mean, I understand the park. You know, you, anybody who wants to do work in the park, including me, has to get a research permit. So getting this research permit from microbiologists also involves this agreement. But this was really the opening of the flood, of the floodgate to, to all the research that followed. And some, and most of the advances, I mean, that follow, was followed by huge advances in, um, in molecular and genetic sequencing. And metabolic pathways in, were found in, were described for all three domains of life in Yellowstone. Um, there's large uh, communities that do not thrive on photosynthesis, but rather on chemosynthesis, and they sh those communities have a much greater genetic diversity compared with those that are uh, use photosynthesis. And at high temperature, what they notice is that the main source of energy is, hi is uh, hydrogen, uh, and it's uh, that's feeds. There's at lower temperatures, there's other metals and metalloids that are used, but at high temperatures, it's mainly hydrogen. And if we look at uh, a lot of features in Yellowstone, and we plot them on, in this case in, in pH versus temperature, in this case uh, concentration of sulfide versus temperature, we note that there's a limit on photosynthesis, which is at high pHs, it's about 75 degrees C right here. But as the pH goes down, so does the uh, limit on photosynthesis. So at a pH of 2, you're going to be at about 40 degrees. That's the limit of photosynthesis. If you look here, you can see that sulfide, high sulfide concentration actually suppresses photosynthesis. And from this up, you're probably, the, uh, those bugs will probably thrive on uh, other sources, including what I just mentioned, hydrogen. Um, so the last topic I want to cover, oops. I want to cover is uh, the cover is a topic that I was more involved, or the second part, I, I did quite a few experiments looking at the dynamics of geysers, but hydrothermal explosions also are uh, 
super important in Yellowstone and the question that comes is what are the controls on episodic discharge of heat and mass? Both of those features, those explosions and the geysers represent this not continuous but episodic release. So what are these explosions? They're, um, they're steam driven, that, they're, that means that there's no magma involved in the eruption itself or the exp explosion. That is when usually when there's a accumulation of a, a lot of pressure on the subsurface until a critical point which break, breaks the lid at the top and then you get that explosion that has a lot of breccia and, and rocks that come through it. And what usually, in, at least in Yellowstone, what leads to these explosions is, is rapid uh, pressure release or decompression and re that is usually the result of mass removal. So you can see here an example of um, in a case where we had some shallow um, boiling in the subsurface and this would be the boiling curve so above it it would be liquid and below it it would be uh, uh, steam and if you suddenly decrease all that pressure above suddenly this whole curve now shifts and you get a much higher uh, larger area where you would get boiling. So this is from here to here that means that you have a deep pressure removal and steam generation usually a two-phase solution is much more compressible and generates a lot of pressure that can break that lead here. So we see these uh, these hydrothermal explosion craters um, all over Yellowstone but they're mainly concentrated around the northern part of Yellowstone Lake. Here's an example of one of those craters it's called Indian Pond right here. Its length is about 430 meters from side to side. But this is relatively small to the biggest one, which is called Mary Bay. This whole circle right here is Mary Bay Crater, which has a diameter of 2.8 kilometers. Uh, that would be uh, over a mile and a half of just from side to side. It's huge. And it formed 13.6 uh, thousand years ago. Um, and you can see here throughout the late Pleistocene and Holocene, there were a lot of explosion craters that formed. Usually most of them were much smaller than than that Mary Bay, which is anomalous. And if we look at dated shoreline terraces from Yellowstone Lake, right here, um, you can see that that erosion of the, that is post-glacial erosion of the uh, outlet from Yellowstone Lake that is right in this area right, right here, right, sorry, right here, um, as that thing eroded away, we have removal of mass from the system, which I told you is something that could promote explosions. So this Mary Bay was 13.6, and then there's other, this Indian Pond, this little tiny thing is Indian Pond, this one right here. But you see that these cycles of terraces going up and down, up and down, so the water level is up and the water level down. And that is associated, was interpreted to represent Caldera, cycles of caldera inflation and deflation. I told you that now at the beginning of the talk that we measure since 1924 we have using and now with using geodetic techniques we can measure that these cycles of inflation and of deflation of the caldera. So when the you can imagine that when the caldera inflates the, the lake goes down and deflates it goes down it goes up. So you can see these and every time you remove that pressure from the water level decreases you remove pressure and there you go with another explosion. We also have much smaller ones even today. I mean, they usually occur about once a year, once every two years. They're very small, often undetected. Uh, some of them occur in the winter when there's nobody almost in the park and, and it's hard to detect. There was a, quite a big one in Midway Geyser Basin called Excelsior. It's now Excelsior Geyser just near that Grand Prismatic, that very colorful spring that I showed before. And that formed this huge crater in uh, the mid 1880s, <coughs> but they still occur today. And the the importance is that, again, USGS we deal with hazards. This is one of the major hazards today in the park is those hydrothermal explosions. Uh, you know, you could have buses full of um, tourists standing at a place, and that thing could explode. That's something that we want to know better how to detect or prevent. And we're not there, but I think in the last or since the park formed, there was no uh, reported injury or casualty as a co uh, resulting from these explosions. So now let's look at geysers. Uh, I assume all of you are familiar with Old Faithful Geyser that I'll show you soon that it's faithful but to a limit. 
and it erupts about every 90 minutes. Now it's 94 minutes. On the other hand, we did a lot of the, our experiments at a geyser about few, a few kilometers away called Lone Star Geyser. It erupts for about 180 minutes for probably about 120 years of record, maybe more than that, but that's how long we have record. So just so that you could see what these geysers look like, here, this is Lone Star Geyser on the top. I'll turn on this video. Here, and here is a, a thermal infrared image of that same geyser. So again, you saw that there's, using the thermal infrared, we can infer a lot of things about the plume, about the heat moving out of the system, and so on. So again, in the last few years, we learned quite a bit using all these different experiments uh, about what controls these eruptions. And uh, my French colleague, Jean van Demlebroek, he's at the University of Savoie. He used uh, data that was collected, actually, in the 90 seismic data that was over uh, Old Faithful uh, Geyser. And what they notice is that there's uh, seismic sources that are produced not underneath, a, exactly underneath a uh, geyser, but also to the side. So these red represent an area to the side, whereas these black dots represent what's in the conduit of the geyser, seismic sources. And these seismic sources result from cavitation of bubbles. So you have boiling and cavitation of bubbles, and every time that you hear that buck of the bubble, that creates a little seismic source that if you have enough instruments and they're sensitive enough, they can detect that cavitation. And if you have a good enough understanding of the system and good software, you can actually locate those sources of cavitation. And that's what they did right here. And if you look in the time domain now, you could see that these reds versus blacks occur in different periods of the eruption cycle. So as you proceed, you know, the, most of the bubbling occurs here and then suddenly it moves to here and leading to the eruption. It's again right in the conduit and immediately then you get the eruption and immediately after the eruption you see these red dots, all the cavitation occurs right here. So we now think that in most cases that this is almost a requirement that you have a, pre, uh, a cavity to the side of the geyser where the two-phase system can accumulate pressure that would drive the eruption. And we did some more experiments and we think we saw it in other systems, but that still needs more work and the physics behind it is, is good but not enough. So what we see here during the last phase when during the eruption itself, you know, again looking now at this area here where there's a constriction. So most of these geysers have, it's, you can envision a pipe, but then there's a small constriction and then this area right here acts like a compressible uh, harmonic oscillator um, actually, um, and is very compressible. So this thing, we, we see what we see at the surface is just leading to the eruption. We see coming out of the surface small amounts of water. We call it preplay, and that releases pressure, and this thing behaves as a compressible, compressible spring. Small amounts of water come until there's enough pressure release, and then the whole thing starts erupting. So what we say is that small phase changes by bringing heat or removing mass and decompression leads to very large pressure variations which drive the system. We know now through uh, quite a few studies that these, the, the way we look at geysers and measure them is through their eruption intervals um, that we know that they change in response to external perturbation. This is a study that I did with a a uh, grad student at Stanford a few years ago looking at using statistics to look at um, these intervals for about f four or five geysers. We looked at more, but four or five were conclusive. And what we see in all of them that they respond, this is like four years of data. Each one is from, from uh, you know, the 12 months and, we, and it represents an average monthly. And when we plot them, you can see that each one of them has, each, uh, this is the Madison River, but if you look at the geysers themselves, you could see that they all have what seems to show a seasonal uh, cycle. But you can also see that these seasonal cycles are not in phase with each other, and actually even contrasting in some cases. And also the wavelengths look very different. Uh, we then used um, a very large data set, so we have now or we had 
focus it's that but we had like over 10 years of eruption interval data for for old faithful right here in this area right here and daisy geyser which is not far away from there right here and you immediately see that daisy geyser has a this very large seasonal cycle whereas in old faithful you really have to stretch to get to see this seasonal but it's not obvious from the from plotting it like this but it was in the past bimodal you can see here it's you know there's some eruptions that have shorter intervals and for example in daisy you could see that there was an area here where it was also bimodal but this amount of data allowed us to look rather than the, in the time domain allowed us to look in the frequency domain so we can look at the frequency characters characteristics of these geysers so here in, in, in red is daisy geyser and in black is a old faithful geyser and then we can look at the response to earth tides for example the fortnightly tide we see that there's absolutely no response and we can look at the semi-diurnal tide there's no response but if we look at that diurnal so we notice that it's not a tide for so that actually old faithful does not respond to anything it does not respond to tides does not respond to atmospheric pressure variations does not respond to temperature variations on the other hand we notice that if you can see in blue here this one peak right here this is the response of of, of daisy geyser to uh, the daily uh, temperature variations which tells us that uh, daisy is a pool geyser that evaporates and that in the winter when days are colder there's more heat released from the system and at the same thing at night compared to day there's more heat released from the system so the intervals are longer and the last one which is I told you about Old Faithful that it's not always that faithful um, there were three large regional earthquakes in the area the uh, 1959 uh, Hebgen Lake earthquake the Bora Peak earthquake and then there was a large one in the park in the 70s and following each one of those big earthquakes we see that the lengthening that the intervals actually lengthen. So in the past, uh, in, if you look in 1960, uh, I think it was in 1950 even, that was about 63 minutes, whereas now it's about 94 minutes. So it's faithful, but to an amount. And you can see here, after the Bora Peak earthquake, we had a few months where we had no data, but then the first time we had data, it got to a new level and never came back to here. So let's summarize this section about the explosions and the geysers. So there were large hydrothermal explosion craters that formed mainly north in, in, in around Yellowstone Lake in the late Pleistocene and Holocene, and those explosions are some of the most significant hazards in the park. Um, we I didn't mention this, but there was also a documentation of a transition from an active geyser. It's called pork chop geyser, Norris Geyser Basin. That was a geyser and then formed an explosion. That's again a case where that happens in Yellowstone. Um, the geysers themselves, they require very unique subsurface structure and complex multi-phase flow. That's why they're so unique. There's only about a thousand, a thousand geysers worldwide, more than half are in Yellowstone. Uh, in some geysers, um, again, I didn't mention this, but in Lone Star, we think that based on those videos that I showed before, we looked at videos of thermal infrared and high-speed videos, and what we could do is use particle velo uh, velocimetry, so measure particles inside the plume and measure their speed and then compare it with some thermodynamic parameters and we inferred that we probably get in some parts of the uh, eruption the, the flow is actually choked or supersonic. And uh, I showed that in the end that geyser eruptions intervals can change in response to earthquakes like in the case of Wild Faithful evaporation like in the case of daisy and seasonal variations like in a few other cases that i showed so obviously you see goes on a super dynamic system and not only we're presented only a few small parts so what's in the future i this review that we wrote represented what we thought was the progress in the last 25 years so where are we going from here so what we really want to do is try to quantify all the dynamic feedback between you saw there's a lot of tectonic processes, there's magmatic processes, there's climate control, and certainly hydrothermal processes. We have to find better linkages between all these controls. We certainly have to improve our airborne and satellite based methods because the park is huge. There's no way that even if we bring there an army of grad students or professors or whatnot, they would not be able to measure all those 10,000 features that change all the time. So we need to improve our ability to use airborne and satellite-based methods to uh, track changes in heat and mass 
out of the system. Um, I just showed you some seismic studies, but we certainly need to uh, invert different geophysical imaging methods. There's a magnetotelluric, there's a, a variety of other methods that we need to take together with a seismic and get better understanding and improve the resolution so we can possibly detect where those melt pockets are at the moment. Uh, we want to try to better quantify the physics and mainly the thermodynamics of two-phase or multi-component flow. This is something that is more and more realized the, the effects and how they interact in the subsurface. So right now our models of how the chemistry tells us what's going at depth relies on simplistic models and we want to improve on those. And obviously this is not me, but the army of microbiologists that roam the park every summer, uh, they are working hardly on trying to uh, improve our understanding of how microbial activity influences the uh, geochemical cycle. So I want to thank you all for coming and your attention. And I want to also note that uh, we're just up the road in Menlo Park, not too far away from here. And we also have a public uh, lecture series. And we have a colloquium and many different seminars. You're all welcome. It's an open campus. You don't have to use any number to open the door. Just come in, and you're welcome. So thanks again. Thank you, Shell. Uh, we have time for a few questions. I'd, I'd like to ask, is there any relationship? Sorry. Uh, OK. Is there any relationship between what's happening deep down at Yellowstone and what's happening deep down under the Hawaiian Islands? Is it the same sort of thing? The processes what? are, you know, there's magma beneath White Islands and there's magma beneath Yellowstone. So it's a magmatic process that controls both the, the composition that you, of fluids that you see at the surface, the heat that comes out, and so on. Yes. So uh, in general, yes, but the tectonic environment is very different. Hmm. Th thanks for your fascinating presentation. Thank you. um, your colleague at Menlo Park, Bernard Chouet, did some research into long period seismic events as um, indicators of pressurizing systems, magma systems, and the potential prediction that comes out of that. Does his work have any application to Yellowstone? Absolutely. So Bernard and his colleague Phil Dawson, they published a paper on, I mentioned this uh, um, pork chop geyser in Norris that that went to, from a geyser, and they published a paper a few years ago looking at, at mainly long period, but also they did some kind of pattern recognition of the, the swarm that occurs there to try to infer. But yes, long period seismicity is, uh, is a big part of how um, mainly multi-phase aqueous fluids move through fractures in the subsurface. So the answer is absolutely yes. If you extrapolate to outside the park where there might be the possibility of geothermal power plants, uh, what can you say about the, the potential and what do you have to worry about to assure that you're not uh, doing anything that affects the geysers or other natural phenomena inside the park? Oh, maybe this is the place where I should shut the microphone. <laughs> so there was a big USGS study in the, uh, let's see if I can find the map, in the uh, in the early um, in the early 1990s, late 80s, and in the area just north of the park, called uh, Corwin Springs, known geothermal area, and that study concluded it was a big it was a big fiasco, but um, <laughs> the study concluded that some of it could be in this area right here just to the north of Mammoth Hot Springs. So obviously, they focused on Mammoth Hot Springs. And they concluded that some power could be generated without affecting um, what's going on at Mammoth Hot Springs. But a, a different USGS scientist came out with, he was very much against it. And then there was other factors that came into play, and that never happened. So the Corwin Springs area here was never developed. There were talks about developing this area. It's called Island Park. But again, that is right now off table and off the limits. And the amount of resource that you might get here, who knows? But it might have a large effect. Over here. So if you thought that question was far afield, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, forgive me for this one. Um, Curiosity rover on Mars has you know, detected methane appearing and disappearing. And I was wondering, I know they don't have plate tectonics on Mars, but I was wondering if you had 
any thoughts at all about uh, those kind of processes that might lead to that sort of, you know, variable detection? So in, in Yellowstone, we do have methane, but usually that methane is uh, methane discharge is associated with areas where there's high concentrations of shallow organic matter in the subsurface. So that would be in the eastern part of the park. Um, there might be some inorganic methanogenesis, but again, uh, and we're more and more now looking at isotopes to try to discriminate between them, but it's not conclusive. I think for now what we are understanding is that mainly due to the spatial uh, location of these uh, methane emissions, they're in areas where you see other, for example, the ammonia that I showed you in, in Washburn, they're in conjunction. So it kind of suggests that it's mainly uh, organic um, combustion and get methanogenesis, but there might be some inorganic uh, methanogenesis as well. Uh, I'm K.R.S. Murthy. Um, are, uh, I didn't hear you mentioning Internet of Things or wireless sensor networks, you know, a, a nano or micro base sensors and so on. Is there any issue not using them here? Because you can have uh, that supplementing the geological work. Uh, no, absolutely. So um, there was a study when in 2010 we got some <coughs> big chunks of money to uh, when the ARA, the uh, affordable, well, not affordable care act, but the, the uh, when the, the stimulus package, we got money and part of it was, or we took some of that money to develop a wireless sensor network in Norris Geyser Basin. So we have there a bunch of thermal sensors throughout the basin and they wor communicate between them and then they transmit it and so on and so forth. It could be developed, but again, Yellowstone is very remote. Um, the transmission is often very complicated, both due to the weather and uh, due to animals that actually think that's quite tasty. So uh, <laughs> so there's th it's kind of a variety of complexities that, but it's certainly okay. the way forward, sir. Sure. Oh, it's a fa fascinating talk. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that millions of years ago there used there were some cataclysmic explosions, very large explosions. Um, is there any chance of this happening in the future? <laughs> so you know, uh, well, here let's go here. As you can see here, and you know that in nature everything is linear. I mean, every process in nature is linear. So obviously all those doomsday scenario folks that I just showed in the first slide, they say, oh, 2.1, 1.4, 0.7, it's probably going to ha happen tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. <laughs> and, and, and the internet is full of that kind of stuff. It's full. It's just saturated. And part of our work is to try to explain what we know. That's our job at the USGS. This is the information we know. This is how we monitor. These are the signals that we're going to record if something would occur. So yes, Yellowstone would have more volcanic eruptions in its future. What kind, when, where, that's where we are monitoring. And we don't have any uh, future predictions. But we are, I think we have a good control of what's happening there right now. OK. Um Further questions should be asked directly to the speaker. Okay. We are a bit over time. Um, so every speaker gets our special SETI Talks mug. Oh, and wow. With the alien robots talking but, but to each empty. other. <laughs> um, we have coffee upstairs. And they're probably talking about how awesome Earth is and how awesome Yellowstone is. Um, so let's uh, thank Shell again. Thank you.